colors of crimson, God wrote his love on a hillside so long ago. For you and for me, Jesus died. Love's greatest story was told. I love you. I love you. That's what Calvary said. I love you. I love you. I love you. Return in red. Down through the ages. The same hands that suffered and bled, giving all he had to give, the message so easily have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 this morning. 1 Corinthians 13, I hope you got a blessing out of all the songs on the love of God. And sometimes I believe we take for granted the love of our mate, we take for granted the love of our parents, but I'll tell you what, one of the most damaging things and one of the most detrimental things in our Christian life is we take for granted the love of God. I'm glad God loves us, amen? I'm glad He loves us in spite of us, I'm glad He loves us, He Eternally, and I'm glad that he gave us a chapter like chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians to discover and realize how much he really loves us. And also, how wonderful it is to be full of the love of God. You know, two sinners can never meet each other's needs. I was talking to um, uh, Brother Andrew down here. How old are you, brother? 22 years old. I said, are you married? He said, nope. I said, I'm looking for one. I said, well, good. One will do. Amen. And so any, all you young ladies want to go to Bolivia, uh, line up after the service, amen? We'll just, we'll set this thing right up, amen? No, we don't do that. But you know, I thank God for the love of my, my wife. Uh, we've been together uh, since 1969. Our first uh, date, I guess you'd call it that, was on August 23rd, 1969. She was selling collard greens and I was selling um, ham hocks and chitlins and, and uh, meat at the meat market in downtown Curb Market in Atlanta. If you've never been there, it's an experience. Brother uh, Pappy uh, had a, a meat market there, but I worked for my, my Uncle James uh, Cofield. Uh, I'll never forget, it was all day Saturday, and I remember uh, couldn't hardly concentrate on ser- uh, selling that meat because I kept looking up there seeing how Connie served those collard greens and all those vegetables, and I said, man... This, this, this could go together, amen? We dated, we dated four years, and uh, got up the, she finally got up the courage to propose to me. No, not really. And uh, I proposed to her, and I'm going to tell you something. I thank God for my wife. I appreciate you honoring me last week, 40 years as pastor, and founded this church 40 years ago. But you know something, friend, uh, behind every good preacher is a great wife, and a patient wife, amen? And I think she's the best pastor's wife I've ever met. I've met a lot of pastors, amen, that's the only one I ever need. So anyway, he's, he's eligible, ladies, amen. But anyway, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, last time I tried to set somebody up, I lost both members, so I ain't doing that stuff, amen, nope, mm-mm, nope, they both got mad at me, so praise God, I ain't setting up nobody, amen, you let the Lord set you up, and make sure you got parental, 
permission. Amen. Okay. First Corinthians chapter 13. But love is great, isn't it? Amen. Love is God. And I want to tell you something, friend. You really can't do anything but manipulate in your marriage if you're not full of God's love. Best you can do is get your little away because people are selfish by nature. But when two sinners die to self, praise God and filled with the Spirit of God, after they get saved, they have the love of God in their life and they can minister out of the fullness of God's love. Say amen. You can overflow with God's likeness and God's love, God's forgiveness. And folks, it's an exciting, exciting time when both... Uh, Husband and wife try to outgive each other, amen? And I got a Greek word for that. When you try to outgive each other, the word is shazam. Praise God. I mean, it's exciting, amen? You outgive each other emotionally. You'll get that later. That's Andy Griffin or something. I don't know. But you, emotionally, physically, and spiritually, and folks, it's spiritual first, emotional second, and then physical last. You don't make love. You express love. And the first two levels of oneness is not there. That oneness is not going to be there. You'll just feel used and manipulated. But I thank God that we can die to self, be filled with God's love, and have not just a marriage, but praise God, you can have spiritual oneness. And you can actually love to go home and be with the one that tries to outlove you. Now that's marriage. And that's God. And folks, He makes that way. But I want to tell you something. He makes the Christian life one that we can be vessels of God's love. I mean, everywhere you go, you can touch people's hearts. You can look at them not as uh, rich or poor or, or, or uh, high and mighty or low and out or black or white or Hispanic. You can look at them as either lost or saved and have a burden for their souls and actually love them to God because God's love is in you. So I believe the greatest gift that the church has ever received is God's love. Amen. I appreciate all the gifts. Praise God. I'm going to get to take my wife out for Valentine's this week on y'all. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> Is she in here? Praise God. I think she's in the nursery. Okay. Amen. I mean, the best steakhouse in the world uh, I get to go to because of y'all. get to go to Alaska. Boy, I've never been there. And uh, just hope I can get back. And it's, uh, I just appreciate all the gifts. But I think the greatest gift is God's love. I believe the greatest gift is when God saved my alcoholic daddy. And filled him with God's love. And he'd always pass out in his plate and we'd have to carry him to bed. It was just terrible. Wrecked cars. And folks, I want to tell you something. I used to want to run away from home. And I did several times. And I got hungry and came back. Amen. About two or three blocks I was back. Amen. Mom would whoop me for leaving. But you know, I always wanted to go uh, run away. And then after I got, uh, after my daddy got saved, and I was down in Claxton, Georgia in uh, 74, 75, right after we got married. I always wanted to come home, and I wanted to catch my daddy up late, not passed out, reading the King James Bible on the couch, and then right before we go to bed, kiss mama and say, I love you. Now folks, Christ makes a difference. And the biggest difference I know of, he delivers us from our sin by the grace of God and our self, and fills us with his love when we become vessels of his love. Isn't that neat? That's a Greek word too, brother. You, you catch all this stuff. Thank God, that's neat. That's, that's wonderful. It's supernatural that two sinners can die to self and love each other, and that's called a happy oneness in God. Don't live beneath that. And I want to go uh, for the next few weeks on the love of God. I never preach uh, the whole sermon at one time, and y'all better be glad. Or we'd be here till 2 o'clock. And I know some preachers that have tried that, and they're no longer there. But uh, I want you to see 1 Corinthians 13. And I want you to look at verses 1. Oh, let's read the whole chapter. Let's stand on the Word of God, okay? Though I speak with tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Paul was ringing their bell on that one because that's the way they worshiped Diana, the sex god, and, uh, in that town in, in Corinth. And, and he knew that there was just a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, to understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, and so that uh, I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to the, be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me, it profiteth me nothing. Now charity suffereth long, and it's kind. We need a revival right there, don't we? Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, 
does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecy, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And now we see through a dark glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am also, also am I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. You may be seated as I pray. Father, thank you for this chapter that gives us the biblical viewpoint of love. Thank you, dear God, that it's a stamp of genuineness. God, it's a sign of real Christianity. Lord, it's the essence of a real church, a church that loves everyone and loves each other and doesn't divide up and politic and split and splatter and splint and fuss and fight. Lord, it's, it's, it's the essence and presence of God in the home. Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. God, thank you. Not only that you admonish us to do that, God, you give us the Spirit of God, the Spirit of love, the fruit of the Spirit, to manifest you in our marriages, in our homes, God, in our church, in our everyday living. God, fill us to overflowing with your love is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I believe the greatest gift that uh, this church has ever received and that this person, has, this sinner has ever received is the love of God. I mean, folks, God loved me when I didn't have anything to offer Him. He loved me with an everlasting love. I love Jeremiah chapter 31 and, and verse 3. The Bible says this. It says, it says, The Lord has appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with a loving kindness... Have I drawn thee? I want to tell you something, friend. People don't care how much this church knows until they know how much we care. Amen? We can be theologians, straight as an arrow, separated, sanctified, thrill-filled, and petrified without love. But I want to tell you something. I'm satisfied with love. I'm satisfied with the love of God. I'm satisfied because God committed His love towards us when I was a sinner Christ died for me. And I want to tell you something, folks. It's, a, it's, a, it's the prerequisite uh, for, for, it's the evidence of faith in Christ. 1 John 3, 14 says, we know that we pass, or excuse me, uh, 4, 4, 19. Or, it says, it's the evidence of faith in Christ. In 1, Corinthians, uh, 1 John 3, 14, it's, it's the proof of life in Christ. It says, we know that we pass from death and life because we love the brethren. We love the brethren. Folks, listen, don't tell me that you are saved if you hate everybody. Don't, don't tell me you're saved if you, if you can't get along with anybody. Folks, listen, when you get saved, you get a new love. Uh, amen? And when you get saved, you have a new liver. Amen? I was saying about, uh, uh, and I wish you'd pray for Gary Ledford right now while I'm preaching. I feel good. I got a few aches and pains because I'm that old. But Brother Gary, he's trying his best to get up this morning. And moved to the pulpit, and just almost went to the be with the Lord two weeks ago, and he wants to preach again, and he wants us to pray for him because he he said I'm gonna give him 20 minutes if I have to wear a mask and don't shake hands with anybody. I'm preaching Sunday morning. I said, well, take it easy, brother. Uh, my son Stevens preached for him the last two Wednesdays on purpose just to keep him out of the pulpit. Amen. But I'll tell you what, I thank God for somebody who has a desire, and he is a loving godly man and so I wish you'd pray for him as I preach folks the Bible says it's a motive power uh, we're constrained with his love for service it's an act of obedience we know, we know that we love him because we keep his commandments John 14 15 it's the queen of all graces that's what I want to get to in a minute but it's the badge of discipleship how do you know a person's really a disciple the Bible says in John 13 35 uh, they'll know that you're a disciple because you love one another Folks, I'm telling you, we need God's love. It's a sign of repentance. 
I'll preach on that tonight, but it's also the secret to service. When John, uh, in John chapter 21, when Peter repented and went, uh, went to uh, the shore and found 153, that's a good number, 153 fish, afterwards Jesus asked him a question, says, do you love me more than these? I'll deal with that tonight. I'm not going to preach long. We're going to sing long, and I'm going to preach. Well, I'll preach long as they sing. Amen? I always do that. But, uh, folks, it's a sign of, uh, a sign of a true uh, service. Uh, folks, uh, when, G- when Peter came back to Jesus, the first thing he wanted him to know is, do you love me? He didn't say, do you love sheep? He didn't say, do you love feeding sheep? He said, do you love me? Folks, the requirement for service, preach on that tonight, is that you love God. Amen? That what you do is an act of worship. That you love God's the reason you preach. You love God's the reason you deek. You love God's the reason you show up on Sunday morning. You love God because so much that you read His love letters from heaven. Folks, listen, there is, a, there is a prerequisite for us being effective as Christians. We need to be full of the Spirit of God. And last time I checked, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Amen? Love. Then all those other things are kind of like fruits of that love. It's a fruit of the Spirit, singular. So the greatest spiritual existence in your home is the love of God. Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. It's the reason to be married, stay married, and enjoy marriage, that he might be magnified. It's not about you. It's about him. Amen? It's not getting your way. It's getting God's way, and it's letting him have his way. And I want to tell you something. When you get out of the way... Nothing's left but God's love. It's exciting. It's thrilling. Are you in a marriage like that? Say amen. Or scoot up closer to your wife. Amen. Or something. Smile at her. Acknowledge she exists. Open the door for her. Two things are new when you open a car door, either the car or the wife. It shouldn't be that way. Amen. We ought to, we ought to, we ought to be gentlemen and we ought to love and we ought to give and we ought to uh, honor the weaker vessel, the Bible says. And folks, I want to tell you something. That respect is out of love. When you lose respect for each other, you're in trouble. When you start taking each other for granted, you're in trouble in your marriage. And folks, I want to tell you something. God's love never takes each other for granted. Amen? I I love this church. A lot of people say, how could you stay in one place 40 years? And they look at me like I can't preach anywhere else or something. And I said, because I love these people and they love me. And I'm afraid I'd go somewhere else and they wouldn't love me and I wouldn't love them. We'd be in trouble. Amen. It's been a wonderful 40 years. I love it. I thank you for all the things that went on last week and all the sacrifice and preparation. It was just a blessing. But I want you to see, first of all, I want you to see the the primacy of love, the priority of love, if I might say that. I want you to look at uh, the first three verses of 1 Corinthians 13. We'll try to preach. I try to preach verse by verse and try to cover a chapter of sermon sometimes but I want you to see that love is superior to everything and to anything according to this Bible according to the word of God it's superior to the sensational now we live in an age and day where people are showing up for a sensational show well I want to tell you something folks there's no jugglers for Jesus clowns for Christ up here there's no worship team and it's not dark out there and light up here for you to see a show Folks, what we want to do is ask God to show up. And we're going to preach the Word of God straight. And folks, if it steps on your toes, walk with correction and praise God the whole way and keep smiling. But I want to tell you something, friend. This ain't a show. We're not trying to have a sensational band. Thank God for God-honoring music that didn't distract from the Word of God, the words of the song, amen, or the Word of God. But I want you to see, first of all, in verse 1, it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, And have not charity, love in action, God's love, Christ's love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. A clanging cymbal called them to worship in the the goddess of uh, Aphrodite. It was was a terrible religion uh, that they worshipped with prostitutes and it was wicked and adulterous. And that cymbal would call them to that worship. And I'm sure when he used that word cymbal, They said, my goodness, what an accusation. If we don't have love, we're like that symbol. And folks, I want to tell you something. I've never seen a symbol solo. Have you, Brother Derek? A symbol solo. Folks, listen. uh, I'm assured that it's, 
you know, it's not very exciting for somebody to, to cling a cymbal. But I want to tell you something, talk's cheap. Singing, some people can do it, some people shouldn't try it. Amen? But I want to tell you, I'm going to tell you this right now. Is that folks, without the heart loving God, it's all a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. It's sensationalism. It's uh, sensual. We didn't come here to get sensual. Even though I think you ought to feel good. And I think it's all right to feel good. Amen? I'll never forget that time I was counseling a lady and she said, I'm leaving my third husband. I said, why? She said, because when I'm around him, I just don't tingle. I said, you don't what? She's serious heart attack. She said, I just don't tingle. I said, you don't what? She said, I just don't tingle when I'm around him. You understand? I said, no, I don't understand. She said, I just don't feel like I love him. I fell out of love. Like she fell in it, and now she's fallen out of it. And I said, well, ma'am, why don't you go over there and stick your finger in that plug right there? You'll get a tingle. But that's not love. That's electricity. And folks, I didn't mean to be crass or mean or anything else, but I want to tell you something, friend. Everybody's looking for a tingle. Everybody's looking for a sensation. I believe we ought to be holy, and then we'll be happy. Can somebody say amen right there? I believe when you're right with God, you're happy. I'll just tell you this. If you're flowing with the love of God, you're about the happiest person in this room. I mean, if you treated your wife like Christ treats the church, you're just probably one of the best men I know in this place right now. You're just probably pretty content. Or did you tell her off or slap her silly before you come to church and then start singing, Oh, how I love Jesus. And then the kids look around and say, Man, this building changed him. <laughs> Folks, listen. The love of God is more than sensationalism. It's more than man-centered. It's God-controlled. And I, I, I want to give you this, and I want to give it to you. I, I, I even thought it was such a good quote that I put it on Facebook this morning. Oh, y'all all rushed to that. Don't do it now, now. I don't allow that now. Don't you get on another text. You stay with this text. Folks, a great speech can move a person's will, but only great love can move a person's heart. Oratory can move one to tears, but only love can move one to Jesus. Amen. You want to see it, see it again. But I'm telling you this, friend. Talk is cheap. We need to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. We need to love God. And we need to love others like God loves us. What a challenge. Amen? And then I see not only is it superior to sensationalism, it's, it's superior to spectacular. Look at verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy and of understanding of mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. I'm a zero. Folks, listen, this verse mentions spectacular abilities. Chapter 12 has been rehearsing that. Hey friend, and then chapter 13, chapter 12 ends with this, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show you and to you a more excellent way. Then he goes into chapter 13. Let's take it in context. Then he goes into chapter 14 and rebukes them all for speaking in tongues. Independently. It rebukes the women for speaking in tongues. It rebukes them for not having an interpreter. I mean, chapter 14 is strong. And it's a sign unto the Jew, verse 22, chapter 14. Not to some unbeliever. He said, hey, listen, if everybody's speaking in tongues and a man comes in, you read chapter 14, they'll think you're crazy. He, the King James says mad. Think you're mad if everybody's gibbering in some unknown tongue. He said, I'd rather speak five words of clear understanding than 10,000 words of an unknown tongue. So folks, listen, they were all wrapped up in gifts. They were wrapped up in the spectacular. They were wrapped up in the sensation. Then he says, I want to show you a more excellent way. He goes to chapter 13 and says, love. Love. Amen? Just be full of God's love. Have that love that makes a difference. And folks, you can do all things, have all kinds of gifts, all kinds of talents. You can be spectacular in your singing, in your preaching, your oratorial ability. But the Bible says if you're not full of God's love, it is nothing. Then third of all, it's superior not only to sensationalism and spectacular stuff, and it's superior to sacrifice. Look at verse 3. And though, isn't the Word of God so clear, so wonderful? Amen. 
It says, and though, that's why I love to preach it, verse by verse. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. By the way, the cupboard's getting low. We need some food. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Folks, listen, he said, I can give up my body on the altar of being a martyr. But if I don't do it because I love God and love the furtherance of the gospel, then it's nothing. It's nothing. He lists seven things in these three chapters. He says eloquence, prophecy, mysteries, knowledge, faith, feeding the poor, and a martyr's death. He says take all seven of them, minus one, no love, equals zero. So the math here is seven minus one equals zero. And folks, all these things and all this spectacularism, all this sensational stuff in this world today, if the motive is not for the love of God, it is absolutely zero. It's nothing. And so then I see not only the, the um, primacy of love, I see the portrait of love here. And folks, you can go, go to verse 4 through 12 and you'll see Jesus. Without Jesus, you can't love. Best you can do is manipulate. Hey, the best you can do is uh, try to be patient in the flesh, and you won't be patient very long. Can somebody say amen? I mean, he's lost patience with somebody this week. I'm, I'm thinking over my week. I'm not, gonna, I'm not even going to go into any illustrations. Paul gives us an in-depth description of love here. First of all, he says, charity suffereth long. You know, I'm going to tell you something, friend. Love is effectual. When they see you doing without, they know you love. Patient endurance under persecution. This church was dying for their faith. This church was in prison for their faith. This church was hungry. This church was becoming, having martyrs, mostly their pastors and leaders, being fed to the lions and, and uh, used as a game. Stephen's a great example of that. Acts chapter 7, he's being stoned. I mean, he's in that pit and big old rocks are being thrown on him for preaching chapter 6. And I want to tell you something, folks. There was a, a man uh, there, or chapter 7 talks about all his whole sermon. Chapter 7. Chapter 6 is about calling deacons. But chapter 7 is about him uh, uh, preaching that message, rebuking religion. Rebuking those Jews. They made him so mad they started gnawing on his sleeve. Now listen, friend. Get mad and walk out, but don't start biting me. Praise God. Amen. <laughs> and they were mad. And then they got mad, threw him in a pit, started stoning him to death. And he didn't have the look of hell on his face. He didn't have the look of hate on his face. He had the look of heaven on his face. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I wonder where he got that from. And I will tell you something. There's a man giving consent to his death named Paul holding his cloak, started making havoc of the church next chapter. And then the Holy Ghost got a hold of him because he kept seeing Jesus' face in Stephen's face. Folks, that's what we need. When we have a hard day, don't take it out on God and look like the devil and act like the devil. When somebody hurts you, don't, don't react in the flesh. Praise God, love them. Love them with the power of the Holy Spirit. Love them in... In Jesus' name, the Lord gave that example in Luke chapter 23 when he was being beat and bruised and marred beyond all recognition as Isaiah said in Isaiah 52 verse 14. They were astonished at his, his image. He was bruised and beat. Uh, cat of nine tails, 351 furrows went across his body. And he said, in all that pain, Father... Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Folks, I want to tell you, this kind of love endures attacks, persecution, problems. And by the way, I don't believe many people notice you until you're going through some tough stuff. I don't believe they really notice you. And they want to see how you're going to react. And if you react with God's love, it makes a pungent testimony that God is real. Anybody can smile when everything's going good. Anybody can smile when you're going to, on a trip to Alaska. I mean, anybody can smile if you're going to the best steakhouse in, 
in Chattanooga. But folks, when you smile through the tears dripping down your cheeks, and you smile when your best friend walks out and doesn't say bye, and you smile when people make fun of you for standing for God on, at school and not going along with a drug crowd and going down the tubes with a cool hand loop group that wants to blaspheme God, then you get their attention. And then you have a platform. It was said of a man named Edwin Stanton called Lincoln a low, cunning clown. He called him the original gorilla. And he even said that this is, that he was, it was ridiculous for people to go to Africa and see a gorilla when they could find one so easily in Springfield, Illinois. He said that publicly. And to Lincoln's credit, he never responded to those insults. Yet when he was elected president, Lincoln chose Stanton as the Secretary of War. When asked why, Lincoln said, because he's the best man. And later when Lincoln had been assassinated, Stanton stood by his coffin, which contained Lincoln's body, and he said this with tears streaming down his face. There, here lies the greatest ruler of man the world has ever seen. Patience and love and forgiveness won that man to the Lord. Folks, I want to tell you something. Love is suffereth long. Then love is kind. Look at verse 4. And it's kind. Now, praise God, we need some revival of that, don't we? Amen? I'm talking about we need some Holy Ghost kindness to our home, in our home, to our wives, and to our husbands. Let me reverse that too. To the husbands. Amen? To the husbands, amen. She's in the nursery, ain't doing me a bit of good. But listen, to the, we ought to have kindness. We ought to treat our mate better than we treat an unannounced guest. Say amen. Y'all even turn the TV off sometime when some company comes, but you wouldn't dare miss a ball game for your wife. Boy, I'm preaching now, praise God. You ladies should have said amen there. Folks, listen, it's, kindness is active goodness. Hey, kindness is not just saying good things. Boy, I'm telling you, folks, it's not being hateful, it's being respectful. You, you care how people think or, or, or they feel. You really care. Your conversation is not just the facts, Sergeant Friday. It's a how do you feel, and, and, and you care how they feel. That's real communication. Amen? I'm going to do a special on, on marriage on Wednesday night and for all of you that come. And, and I tell you what, you ought to go celebrate Valentine's, whatever that is on Thursday, don't skip church because I want to tell you something, without Christ you wouldn't have a marriage and you won't have a marriage. So come to the house of God and I'll help you with some things for your marriage but I want to tell you something folks, it's kind all we need to do is show some respect. If you start taking each other for granted, you're in trouble in your marriage. And then the Bible says that love envieth not. Envieth not. We're not jealous over the abilities and possessions of others. And then, 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 then love does this. It vaunteth not itself. I want to tell you something, folks. Love destroys selfishness. The opposite of selfishness is love. Am I preaching this morning to where you live? I mean, we all are by nature selfish. Can somebody say amen and poke your husband in the ribs right there because you know it's the truth. But thank God, friend, I'm going to tell you something. We need to realize that this literally means it does not make a parade. It's vaunted. It does not brag. It does not draw attention to itself. Folks, the love of God brings attention to the source of love and the source of life and the source of everything that's good and perfect. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Then I like this next description of love. It's not puffed up. It's not puffed up. One time I was deep sea fishing and caught one of those blow fish. And as soon as it got on the deck of that boat, I was so sick I couldn't hardly see it. And, I, and it blew up on me. I said, man, that looks like one of my members. Probably, no, no, I didn't say it. I didn't say it. I didn't say it. I thought that. I didn't say it. Didn't say it. Didn't say it. And folks, we get easily puffed up. Amen? I, li I like that song by Pat Sapire about poochie mouth disease. Amen? My, I play that so much for Stephanie. She's probably watching. I'd play that for all my kids, amen, because they'd all get poochy mouth. I mean, they'd, I, and, and I've, had preach, I've had people while I preach look at me that way. You, hey, listen, I've been preaching 44 years. You're not going to intimidate me 
it's just going to discourage me, so I'm trying to look away. But I want to tell you something, friend. There ought to be a nod once in a while. There ought to be a smile once in a while. There ought to be an amen. But I want to tell you something. There ought to be some conviction, too, that sometimes we're too easily offended. We need divine love. Then does not behave itself unseemly. Love is never rude. Love controls the emotions. One time a lady joined our church and said, I want to tell you right now, preacher, I say what I think. And I walked off and said, oh, Lord, help us with glory and grace. And I want to tell you something. For many years, she said what she thought. I'd tell a joke about a mother-in-law. She said what she thought. She'd get me at that door and say, I don't appreciate you making fun of mother-in-laws. I said, I was just making fun. But anyway, folks, sometimes we've got to not be puffed up, but we need not behave ourselves unseemly. Genuine love always makes Jesus look good. Genuine love always makes Jesus look good. <laughs> I hope I reflected last week praise to Him. Because I want to tell you something. As I said Sunday night, if it wasn't for the grace of God, I'd just be a son of a drunk in some, some alley somewhere trying to find the next meal. But God saved my soul at 11 and a half years of age. Called me into the ministry. It's all by God's grace. Called me to this beautiful town. And got to meet some of those beautiful people I've ever met in my life. It's all by God's grace. And when I'm full of myself, I can't even get along with myself, much less you. Say amen, Miss Connie, all the way from the nursery. But anyway, listen, <laughs> it seeketh not our own. Jesus left the splendor and glory of heaven to prove how much He loved us. And then I like verse 5. It says, Do not say unseemly, seeketh not our own, but is, is not easily provoked. You know, love does not demand its own rights. Well, i got a right to be mad. No, you don't. you got a right to love and forgive. My will be done. No, it's His will be done. We yield our will to God. And when we yield our will to God, He fills us with His Spirit, and His Spirit is love. And then thinketh no evil. Literally it means takes no worthless inventory. Two thoughts in our mind are here. First, genuine love does not attribute evil motives to people. You know, people are trash collectors. Amen. I mean, they're looking for something wrong, you know. And usually they, the reason they're looking for something wrong is because they're so low in the ditch of insecurity, they want company. I used to be that way. I was a nervous wreck as a child. and I always was looking for people to come down to my level so I'd criticize them. That's an awful way to exist. Folks, we're accepted in the Beloved. We are significant in Him. And I'm not saying we're stuck on ourselves because that's a wild imagination, not just pride. But praise God, friend, I'm going to tell you something. When God fills us with His love, when God fills us with His love, we don't look for trash. We become treasure collectors. And we look for something good in somebody's life. And I'm not saying like, oh, Robert, something good's going to happen to you today. It might be something bad happening to you today. But praise God, no matter what happens to you today, God still loves you. And His love is enough to minister through you. And so folks, don't take worthless inventory. Folks, listen, don't be so negative. Genuine love does not keep a record. Strike one, strike two, strike three, you're out. That's not good relationships, that's baseball. Come on, say amen. Most of our hurts are perceived hurts. We just think it happened that way. That's why we learn to treat others like the Lord treats us. We must treat them with grace and forgiveness. Real love does not remember injury. Hey, you want to really get over your bitterness? Because bitterness will eat your lunch. Bitterness turned in is depression and bitterness turned out is anger. You can either kill somebody or kill yourself. That's a terrible tragedy. And folks, I want to tell you something. If you'll love the person like God loves you, you won't be bitter at them. 
you will forgive them. You might not be best friends, but you'll still love them. Say amen. God didn't call you to be best friends with everybody, but God said love everybody. You don't have to live with somebody. You just don't need to let it live with you. You don't hold a grudge. A grudge holds you. It's the worst prison in the world. Matthew chapter 18. You need to forgive. You need to look, and, and you know, real love does not look for faults in others. I believe if we practice this in this church, all our problems will be gone. And I thank God for the unity in this church. I don't take it for granted. As far as I know, there's not a click in this church. If there is, I get right in the middle of it and try to unclick it. Because, folks, we're all equal in God's eyes. And the foot of the and the level of the cross is, I mean, the foot of the cross is level. Ain't no big shots in this church. Ain't no little shots. I don't know, sorry sinners and good sinners. Folks, we're all sinners saved by grace. We ought to love people like God loves us. They might get right, they might get saved. Classism in the church. Splits and splatters and splits. Most churches in this town started because somebody couldn't get along with somebody. When I was knocking on doors 40 years ago, every day I'd knock on doors and they'd say, what split are you out of? I'd say, I ain't out of a split. I'm here to win so. One, one lady said, you, are you a prat? I said, I don't even know what a prat is. I, my mother called me a brat, but I'm not, I don't even know what a prat is. Call, I was called everything knocking on doors, amen? But there's one thing I wasn't called. I ain't trying to uh, split churches and start another one. This church started right. Maybe that's why it's lasted. It rejoices not in iniquity. Love does not rejoice in sin. Verse 6, there it is. Rejoices not in iniquity. But what's it do? It rejoices in the truth. Truth wins the victory. Love is glad about the truth. Amen? Aren't you glad you've, you, you're hearing a message of the truth? It's not all fun and games, and it's not all rock and roll stars up here, and it's not a celebrity in the pulpit. It's a servant of God trying to preach to you the truth. Because the truth will set you free. And it'll set you free from your selfishness. It'll set you free from your pride. It'll set you free from living a life without love. Rejoices in truth. And then love is not only um, the primacy, it's preeminent, and love is portrayed in this chapter, but I see love's persistence in verse 7 through 12. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. Hard work and grit will continue to work, but I'm going to tell you something. The only way you can see it to the end is love. The only way you're going to be faithful is love. The only way you're going to remain faithful is you love Jesus. It beareth all things. Folks, listen, I want to tell you something. Peter's testimony, when he got right with God, to deal with it tonight. First thing Jesus said, do you love me? Then he said it again, do you love me? Do you love me? Three times. Because he knew the problem in Peter's heart was he'd taken the love of God for granted. And he loved himself and cussed and denied that he even knew Jesus. So he's looking after number one, self. Believeth all things, hopeth all things. Expects the best possible outcome. That's love. Dureth all things. It's a military term. It means hold the fort. Verse 8 through 12 says, love never fails. Verse 8 says, charity never faileth. Neither there be prophecy, they shall fail. Where there be tongues, they shall cease. Where there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. We know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is part shall be done away with. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but... When I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Charity. Folks, I believe with all my heart, this talks about the preeminence of love. Love's right. Love is hope. 
in action. What makes love so great is the definition of love. I want to close with this. 1 John 4, 8. Look at it. 1 John 4, 8. You all know the verse, but I want you to see it, circle it, and engrave, let the Holy Ghost engrave it in your heart. I'm glad I can start my 41st year preaching on the love of God. Not because of St. Valentine's. I ain't figured that out yet. Hallmark is making a killing. But I tell you what, it's good to express your love. I mean, it's all right. And Wednesday, I, I advise you men, don't, don't forget it. Amen? It'll help you. But look at 1 John 4, 8. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. God is love. When the Bible wanted to describe God in one sentence, you know what he said? God is love. Let's pray. Father, Thank you, dear God, for this chapter. Thank you, God, for the challenge. God, thank you that the Holy Spirit can fill us to overflowing, and we don't have to be just ourself, but we can let you be who you are through us. And Lord, you said in 1 John 4, 8 that you're love. And Lord, you said that if we don't know you, we don't know love, and we don't have love. Best we got's infatuation. Best we got's our selfish motives. Best we got, it's the best we can do. But dear God, if we have you, we have love. God, deliver us from our selfishness. Deliver us from our self. Deliver us from the penalty of sin. Thank you, God, for saving us. God, please, please, dear God, help us as we see tonight to do all things because we love you. Lord, I thank you for putting chapter 13 in between chapter 12 and 14 these strong verse these strong chapters on rebuke because the church was in a mess the church was going through a terrible thing in 1 Corinthians and God right in the middle of it you said well, I want to show you a more excellent way love God fill this church with your love put a hedge around our relationships with your love God, help us to love sinners like you love them. God, help us to love your word. Help us to love your church. Help us, dear God, to love you as never before. With all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our might.